My name is Maria Jose Juan Corda. I recently defended my PhD work at the University of La Coruña, and today my objective is to share my PhD work with you. This work was supervised by Iago Mosqueira, working at the European Commission Joint Research Center in Italy, Nicolas Dalby, working at Simon Fraser University, Canada, and Juan Freire at the University of La Coruña in Spain. So as you may know, the world population has hit the 7 million mark. And with it, it comes a long history of human-induced impacts on marine ecosystem, from overfishing to climate change to habitat destruction and pollution. One of the most pressing questions in ecology is to understand and quantify how marine species and marine ecosystem are responding to human-induced impacts. However, assessing these impacts is challenging, in part because large-scale experiment and long-term manipulation is very difficult to do in open marine systems. The European project MetaOceans, where my PhD originates, addresses these challenges and trains 14 PhD students to utilize existing data sets, from fisheries data sets, biological data sets, ecological data sets, that have been generated in numerous regional and international programs that are commonly underutilized once these programs are done, and trains us to utilize these data sets using meta-analysis and other methods such as comparative techniques. Within this meta-ocean vision, my thesis aims to provide new insights on the impacts of fishing on marine species and marine ecosystems and advance our predictive ability to identify which species might be most vulnerable to fishing. Among all the threats, fishing has been identified as the major threat to marine species and marine ecosystems. And while we have a good knowledge of how fishing has sequentially expanded to all, to all the world's oceans during the last 60 years, our understanding of the historical impacts on marine species and ecosystems remains fragmentary and uncertain. And also, our biological uh, knowledge on the current exploitation status for the large ma majority of the species that, we, that are impacted directly or indirectly by fisheries is also very known or poorly known. Less than 1% of marine fish species have been properly assessed with fisheries stock assessment. And globally, there are more than 15,000 marine species. So given that traditional stock assessments are, they are costly and require good quality data sets that does not exist for the majority of the species, we need methods and we need tools to identify a priori what species are most vulnerable and what species might be most threatening from fishing. So in this thesis, we focus on scumbrid species to, ad to address these two global challenges, by who are the scumbrids and why we picked the scumbrids. The scumbrids of the family Scombridae includes 51 species, including tunas, bonitos, Spanish mackerels, and mackerels. These species are globally distributed through the tropical and temperate waters of the world's oceans, and they are key components of pelagic ecosystems. Within this family, tuna includes the most economically important species, known as principal market tunas. This includes the yellowfin, albacore, skipjack, bluefin tuna, and big eye tunas. These species have oceanic distributions and they're highly migratory. While the rest of the scumbrid species, the small tunas, the bonitos, the macros, and the Spanish macros, they have more coastal distributions. So the scumbrid species support some of the largest and most valuable fisheries in the world, from large-scale industrial fisheries to small-scale artisanal fisheries. Also, they're caught in recreational fisheries, and some of them are even caught as bycatch species in other fisheries. So I'm going to show you the global catches of scumbrids globally within the last 50 years, and we find how catches have been continuously increasing over time almost reaching 10 million tons in the year 2008. And most of these catches are made up of principal market tunas and mackerel species. But altogether, the scumbrids contribute to 15% of the global marine fish catches. These species are also fascinating from the point of view of management. Because these species are highly migratory, they have widespread distributions and their economic importance, there are five regional fisheries management organizations known as tuna commissions that are specifically in charge to manage and conserve these species, tuna species, and associated species, which includes a lot of the scumbrid species. So why we pick the scumbrids? There are two main reasons why in this PhD I focus on the scumbrid species. The first one is that when I started my PhD, the impacts of fishing on, on pelagic species, particularly tunas, 
and the global state of tunas was highly debated in the scientific literature. The debate originated in this study by, by Myers and Warren, published in the year 2003, that claim concluded that large pelagic fishes had been reduced by around 90% from pre-industrial abundance. This study was highly controversial because it used time series of catch of units effort coming from one fishing year, the Japanese long line, and used it as an index of abundance to, infer, to infer the global status of large predatory species, which included tunas, and this led to overestimation of tuna declines. Several rebuttal papers were published at that time making this point, and these papers emphasize the risk of using CPU trends as an index of, amb of abundance to assess and infer the overall health status of populations. And these papers claim that an alternative source of data can be found in fishery stock assessment, which provide more reliable estimates of population sizes and trajectories. So it's an opportunity, and given the increasing availability in stock assessment for many scumbred species, and given the ecological, social, and economical uh, importance of this group of species, I thought it was important to reevaluate the global trajectories of this group of species within the last 50 years. The second reason I picked scombris is because many of these species, given their economic importance globally, a large number of biological studies have been published within the last 50 years. And these biological studies give us an opportunity to examine the role of life histories in combination to fishing to predict the vulnerability of the species. This information, in turn, can be very valuable to manage data poor scombris species. So this was our, well, our second main reason. Within this context in mind, my PhD work is divided in three main sections. In the first section, I carry out a meta-analysis of the global impacts of fishing on scombris species. And specifically, I, I, I address two main questions. Have industrial fisheries removed 90% of the biomass of tunas globally? And what is the current exploitation status of the scumbrids? In the second section, I focus on characterizing and learning about the life history status of scumbrids, which is this information is determinant to understand how a species respond to fishing exploitation. In chapter three, I ask this main question. What are the critical data gaps hindering the assessment and conservation of scombrids? And in chapter four, I wonder if the life history of scombrid, if the diversity of scombrid's life histories can be simplified to a reduced number of strategies and dimensions. In the last section, I use the ecological insights gained in the first two parts, and I put them together in order to examine the role of life histories and fishing in determining their population trajectories. And I ask these two main questions. What scumbrid species are the most vulnerable to fishing? And what life history traits best diagnose those species most likely to decline and be overfished? And at the end, I will briefly summarize the main findings of this PhD. So specifically in chapter two, I carry out a meta-analysis of biomass trends across scumbrid populations using mixed models in order to quantify the global impacts of fishing on this group of species within the last half century. And second, I summarize their current exploitation status using two common reference points. But first I had to compile all the available fishery stock assessment that, uh, that were available globally. At the end, after careful data screening, I end up assembling a 26 structure stock assessments covering 26 populations of 11, covering 11 of the 51 species of scombrids. I had data for 17 populations of tuna, five mackerels, and four Spanish mackerels. From these stock assessments, I extracted time series on adult biomass, fishing mortality rates, and fisheries reference points. So here I'm showing you the data. I'm showing you the trends in adult biomass over time for the 26 populations of scombrids. See the temperate tunas, the tropical tunas, the mackerels, and the Spanish mackerels. Don't worry about the names and the colors, but just notice how most of the uh, time series of biomass are decreasing over time. This is keep, this, keep in mind that these declines are expected, some of these declines are expected under the current fishing mortality plans, because it's very common, a very, a very, uh, a very a very common objective in fisheries management is to decrease the biomass of the population to the biomass that provides the maximum sustainable yield. So keeping this in, in mind, I use two metrics to quantify fishing impacts on fishing. The first metric 
is the average annual rate of change, which tells me how fast the biomass is decreasing over time. And I estimated these rates globally across the 26 population, but also within oceans, within major taxonomic groups, and within life history groupings. The second metric was the total extent of decline. I estimated how much the biomass has decreased within the last 52 years within the same taxonomical and spatial scales. While the second metric, the overall extent of decline, is an indicator of ecosystem removals, the first metric, the average annual rate of change, is an indicator of how well management is performing. So what did we find out? Here I'm showing you the global trends in adult biomass for the 26 populations of scombris, and I find estimated that the total adult biomass has decreased by 52% globally within the last 50 years. And then this biomass has been decreasing with an annual rate of change of minus 1.75 annually, which is equivalent to a 50, almost, almost to a 60% decline on average across the 26 population. Then also notice some of the gray lines and the dashed lines. That's because I did a JAGNAF analysis to estimate the effect of removing one population at a, time, at a time and see how it affects the global trend. So for example, if the skipjack tuna from the West Pacific is uh, uh, taken out from the analysis, which is a very abundant population, we find that the global biomass of scombrids have decreased a bit more, uh, about uh, almost 70%. Also, I estimated fishing impacts by ocean, and I find that despite the different histories of, of exploitation in each ocean, we find substantial decline in all of them. And I estimated that the faster and the larger declines have happened in the Indian Ocean. Perhaps this is due to the fact that the Indian Ocean was relatively unexploited in the 50s compared with the other two wh where the history of exploitation is much longer. I estimated fishing impacts by major taxonomic groups, and I find that within the last 30 years, the adult biomass of mackerels have increased by 40%. Then for the tunas, the adult biomass has decreased by uh, uh, 50%. And then for the mackerels, the adult biomass has decreased by 60% within the last 50 years. But when I group the tunas according to their climate, I find that temperate tunas have declined by 75% and tropical tunas by 45%. So if you remember, these numbers differ from the more pessimistic numbers that were, that were estimated in Myers and Ward paper, where it claimed a 90% decline in large predatory species globally, which included many, many tuna species. Perhaps the 75% per, percent decline that number is a bit close to the 90% decline estimated in the Myers, but you need to keep in mind that globally temperate tunas make a small proportion of the catches. The majority of global tuna catches are made of tropical tunas. At the end, temperate tunas and macro populations have declined the most within the last 50 years across all the, all the species. Next, I summarize the current exploitation status for these scumbred populations using two common fisheries reference points. The first one is the current biomass, is the ratio expressing the current biomass relative to the biomass that provides the maximum sustainable yield. If the current biomass is above BMSY levels, we say that the population is overfished. And if it's below, we, no, we say that the population is not overfished. And if it's below, we say that the population is overfished. The second ratio is the current fishing mortality relative to the fishing mortality that provides the maximum sustainable yield. If the current fishing mortality is below FMSY, we say overfishing is not occurring. And if it's above FMSY, we say that overfishing is occurring. Is it very common in fisheries to take these two ratios and plot them against each other to summarize the current exploitation status of populations? So if the populations fall within the top left corner, we say that the populations are overexploited. And if it falls with the, within the uh, bottom right corner, we say that the populations are healthy. And then we have the other two intermediate stages. So what do we find for scombrids? I found that there are four populations of scombrids, mostly bluefin tunas, that are overexploited. And then I find that the majority of um, scombrids, uh, 15 of them, mostly tropical tunas and Spanish mackerels, are currently healthy. And then we have few in intermediate sta uh, we have few populations in the intermediate stages. But at the end, if you notice, most of the populations are in the center, crossing those lines, which means that the majority of the populations are fully exploited. 
which means that the management objective of, of reaching MSY has been met and we can conclude the majority of the tuna populations are relatively well managed. However, there are four issues of concern. The first one is as just, is as just mentioned, is that the majority of the populations are fully exploited globally, which means that an increase in catches in these fisheries, in these populations, is very limited in the short term without jeopardizing the long-term sustainability of these species. And this is happening in a very uh, um, complex context globally because we know that globally there is overcapacity in tuna fisheries and we know that there are ongoing increases in the rates of fishing mortality and an ongoing increase for demand for tuna, for tuna meat. So one of the uh, ob obvious uh, solution to this issue is that we need to control al al and eliminate overcapacity in tuna fisheries globally. The second issue is that some of the populations are clearly overexploited, so the ongoing recovery plans for these species, they need, to be they need to be effective in order to recover these populations to healthy level. The third issue is that the productivity of some tuna populations have been declining over time, in part because of excessive fishing mortalities of juvenile tuna. And the fourth issue are the collateral impacts of tuna fisheries on other less productive species. One of the obvious solutions for these two issues is that we need to reduce bycatch of juvenile tunas and we need to reduce bycatch of less productive species. And I have to say here that uh, currently there are great ongoing efforts and research to try to modify fishing operation and fishing gears to reduce impacts, to reduce bycatch of juvenile tuna and bycatch of less productive species. But the RFMOs, which are in charge of managing these species, have not yet implemented successful measures for these issues. Moreover, I think that many of these issues could be alleviated and solved if fisheries management bodies, the tuna RFMOs, adopted limit and target reference points, harvest control rules, and used the precautionary approach in their decision making. Right now, only one tuna commission, the RFMO, has adopted these elements as management tools. However, I have to say that in the last few years, even since this paper was published, some of this work was published, so much work has been done by the commissions, specifically the scientific group within the commissions that are now working towards defining these elements so they can be incorporated in the near future and adopted by the commission as management, as management tools. So far, I believe I have successfully summarized the global impacts of fishing on 26 population of population of scombrids, which covers 11 of 51 species of scombrids. This study mostly focused on principal market tunas and temperate macros, and because these are the species where the data is available. But to me, 26 population, 11 species, this number seem ver seems very small to me, given that the majority of the scombrid species, except three, support uh, important fisheries throughout the world. So this reflects another reality, the current exploitation status for the large majority of small tunas, Spanish mackerels, bonitos, and tropical mackerels is not known or very poorly known. And geographically, the Indian Ocean and the Indo-Pacific region is the region with most data poor, is the, is the ocean which is considered, the, it's a data poor ocean. There are 34 species of scombris, 23 being endemic, endemic to this region for which exploitation status is very poorly known or not known at all. Should we be concerned about this? Well, the perception that small scale fisheries for these species, the perception that uh, their catches and their value are irrelevant has been reversed. Perhaps the current priorities and structures of the RFMOs might not be appropriate, appropriate or, may, or might be lacking in the capacity to provide scientific advice to manage these species. Now we're going to switch gears and in the second part, I turn my focus to examine and learn about the life history strategies of scombrids. This section requires the compilation of life history information for the 51 species of scombris globally, and with this information, I created a life history data set. So first, I will describe a bit the life history data set that I created, and then I will present the main findings of chapter three and chapter four. So here I'm showing the, the global distribution of life history studies, and I end up extracting life history information for almost 700 life history studies after I carefully uh, selected them following a criteria. 
So what did the information extracted from these studies? I extracted information on maximum size of the species, also longevity estimates, growth rates, growth rates extracted from benetalafic growth function. Also, I extracted information about the reproductive biology, including length and age at 50% maturity. I have several metrics that describe fecundity in fishes, also spawning duration and spawning frequency. Because uh, scum breeds, all the species, they're batch, they're batch spawners, which means that they spawn multiple times throughout the spawning season. So with this information, in chapter 3, I focus on synthesizing the life history information available, and I critically review it to identify gaps in knowledge. And then I set priorities for future life history research. But first, I would like to emphasize the importance of the, the, the I would like to emphasize the importance of having good knowledge on the life history of the species, because the life history of the species is not only fundamental to understand how a species respond to exploitation. There is important to understand a species invasion, extirpation, and extinction. How a species respond to protected areas and climate change. So here, the key question of this chapter: What are the life history data gaps currently hindering the management and conservation of scombrids? Here I'm showing you the list of life history traits against the number of species, 51 species of scombrids, and then 23 populations of principal market tunas. Because when I did this review, I did the review at the species level for the scombrids, and for the principal market tuna species, I did it at the population level. And this is because for principal market tunas, the data was available and also given their economic importance. So what do we find out? Maximum size, together with growth and longevity, is available for all or most of the scombrid species and principal market tuna populations. While we found that the reproductive biology of the species, maturity and fecundity, is the least studied biological aspects in scombrids. And surprisingly, it is even poorly known for the principal market tuna populations. So at the end, one third of the species had reasonable information, complete information on growth and the reproductive biology. Half of the species, we call them data poor, which means that they, e they either lack information on their growth patterns or reproductive biology. And eight species of scombrids, we consider them data ugly. And, and for these species, we know little more than their maximum body sizes. Among the four taxonomic groups, <coughs> we found that the biology of tuna mackerels have been more extensively studied. This is the list of the species. Don't worry about reading it. And this is the number of studies that were, have been published for these studies. And I highlighted in tunas and mackerels and see and compare it with bonitos and Spanish mackerels. Bonitos and Spanish mackerels, their biology is least, has been least studied, although there are exceptions in all the taxonomic groups. So next, I wanted to identify priorities in life history research. And in order to prioritize research, I established a criteria based on the life history data gaps identified on the species, the importance of their fisheries, and their conservation status according to the IUCN Red List. So if the species had large life history data gaps were targeted by fisheries throughout the distributions and they are threatened or data deficient in the IUCN red list, we consider them to have the highest priority research needs. So next, I'm going to illustrate you the priority species which I use uh, using a Venn diagram. So we learned that there are 10 species of scombris that are data poor or targeted by fisheries and they're threatened or near threatened or data deficient under the IUCN red list. And then there are 22 species that are data poor, life history data poor, and are targeted uh, by fisheries throughout their distribution. At the end, we recommend that life history research should be focused on these two groups of species, which at large, the majority of the species are small tunas, bonitos, Spanish mackerels, tropical mackerels in the Indian Indo-Pacific region. So with this study, I hope I have raised the attention to focus more research and more work on the life histories for the smaller coastal scombrid species. Although these species have lower, have lower economic value in the global markets compared with the principal mar market tunas, these species sustain important fisheries throughout their distributions and they're a source of wealth and food security for many fishing communities throughout the world. In the next chapter, I use all the life history available to characterize and learn about the life history strategies of scombris. First, I examine the main patterns in the life history traits. And second, I evaluate how many principal axes of trade variation underlie their life history strategies. But first, I would like to show you some of the diversity in the life history traits that we find within the family. 
For example, maximum size ranges from 30, 31 centimeters in the Indian mackerels to 40 meters in bluefin tunas. Longevity varies from two years in the Indian mackerel to 41 years in the uh, bluefin tunas. And because size is strongly related to other biological processes, we also find a uh, large variation in growth patterns, length and age and maturity and fecundity. Then we have a spawning, which uh, varies from daily in the tropics, like in the skipjack, to annually uh, for the bluefins, which concentrate the spawning period within a, a shorter period of time. Some species undertake annual migrations, other seasonal migrations usually linked to the reproductive cycle. Some species have ocean, oceanic distributions, other coastal distributions. Some species are associated in coral reefs and uh, to coral reefs and, and islands. And some species are associated to estuaries. For example, there is one species that migrates up to the Mekong River in Cambodia. And then some species uh, are cosmopolitan. Others in the other extreme have very restricted ranges. For example, the Indo-Pacific mackerel is restricted to one estuary in Papua New Guinea. Some species from large schools, others are solitary, if, like for example, Wahoo. So given the large range in life history attributes in the species, their wide distributions and types of habitats, scombrids represent an opportunity to study life history variation and study their life history strategies. So next, in order to capture this diversity in life history, several uh, life history theories and approaches have been put forward. For example, one, one of the first uh, theories was the ARC selection theory, which predicts one-dimensional continuum with two endpoint strategies. But this theory has been challenged in part because one-dimensional uh, continuum is not enough to explain the full diversity of life histories that we find in nature. Alternatively, empirical analysis of life histories in several taxonomic groups from reptiles, uh, fishes, plants, insects, even viruses, have identified a two-dimensional triangular classification system with three endpoint strategies that better explains the, the diversity of life histories and the evolution of adaptive strategies. And in fishes, these three endpoint strategies have been called periodic, opportunistic, and equilibrium. A periodic species tends to be long-lived, uh, tends to be big, delay reproduction, have high fecunditys, and they tend to be found in uh, productive habitats. Opportunistic species, they tend to be uh, smaller, shorter-lived, have fast generation lengths, uh, smaller fecunditys, and they tend to be found in disturbed unpredictable environments. And then the third one, equilibrium species, they tend to have medium to long generation lengths, have fast generation time, I know, uh, medium, medium to large generation length, have a slow growth rates, have low fecundities and important, have a best high energy uh, per offspring, and at the end, these species, they tend to be found in unproductive, uh, stressful environments. So with principle, we use principal component analysis to examine how many axes of life history variation exist in scombris. And for this analysis, we use 10 life history traits covering seven species of scombris. And second, I interpret the results. And, and we ask the question where scombris fits within the triangular model of fish life histories. So how many axes of life history variation exist in scombris? This is the first axis, or the first principal component axis. And I find that maximum size is strongly uh, loads highly along this axis, together with length at maturity, fecundity at maturity, age at maturity, longevity, growth rate, spawning interval, and number of eggs per gram. So the point here is that all the life history traits loaded high against the first principal component, especially the length related traits such as length at maturity. So at the end, this axis, what it's doing is ranking the species along a con size continuum, ranking the species from the smallest to the largest. The second axis uh, that I show here now, you have already not probably you have already noticed that many of the life history traits that loaded high along the first one also loads high along the second one, particularly the time-related traits: C-spawning duration, growth rate age of maturity and longevity. At the end, the second axis describes the slow, fast continuum of life histories, ranking species according to their speed of life. 
So next, I wanted to see how Scombris species ordinate along these two axes, and I find four distinct groups. In one corner, we have the southern bluefin tuna and bluefin tuna, which are large species that are relatively long-lived. In the second corner, we have yellowfin and big-eye tuna, which are large species, but that relatively they tend to be shorter-lived and have faster growth rates. In this other corner, we have the small species, Atlantic mackerel and spotted, and spotted mackerels, which tend to be relatively long-lived and have slow growth rates. And in the other corner, is, uh, other corner is skipjack tuna, which is a small species that tends to be relatively uh, short-lived and has faster growth rates. <coughs> so at the end, you probably notice that the species with the slowest life histories, they tend to have it most temp the most temperate climates, while the species with the fastest life histories, they tend to have in more tropical environments. So what about the third axis? Is there a third axis explaining life history variation? First, remember that the size gradient explains 60% of the variation. The second axis, the speed of life gradient, explains 23% of the remaining variation. And then the third axis explains 13% of the remaining variation. With this third axis, we had two traits, two reproductive traits loading high, change of fecundity with size and fecundity at maturity. These two traits together uh, describe the reproductive uh, allocation in fishes. So species that change in fecundity with size very fast, they tend to ha they have a slow fecundities at maturity and the opposite in the other extreme. So at the end, the principal component analysis has shown that most of the variation in, in the traits can be explained along three gradients. The first one is the, a body size gradient. The second one is the slow fast continuum or the speed of life gradient. And the third one describes the reproductive allocation in fishes. While the first and second axis has been observed in many taxonomic groups from birds, reptiles, and mammals, the third axis is less well supported and its interpretation varies among groups. So along these three axes, <coughs> we could only ordinate seven species of scombris, for which the li 10 life history traits were available. So what about the rest of the species after all the time I spent collecting life history data? So what I thought and what we did is we said, given that the first two gradients combined explain 80% of the variation, why we don't take these two axes and then uh, generalize it to the rest of scombris species? Let's use maximum body size as a proxy for the first axis and longevity as a proxy of the second axis. And we had information for 42 species of scombrids. So here I'm plotting longevity against maximum size. And we find that longevity increases with maximum size, but also observe that for any given maximum size, we see variation in longevities. For example, among the largest species, uh, larger than two meters, yellowfin tuna can live up to eight years, while southern bluefin tuna can live up to 41 years. Very similar for species with intermediate body sizes and also for the smallest comrade species. For example, friga tuna uh, can live up to four years, and then Atlantic mackerel, with a very similar size, can live up to 15 years. So next, I wanted to rank species according to their speed of life. For that, I took longevity and growth rate as size corrected them, which means that I removed the effect of maximum body size on the traits, and then I plotted the data. So here I'm showing the species ranked according to their speed of life, irrespective of their maximum body size. And we learned that Atlantic mackerel and Atlantic self mackerel, together with southern bluefin tuna and narrow Spanish mackerels, all this, the, the species with the slowest life histories. While in the other extreme, the island mackerel, yellowfin tuna, and plain monito are the, are the species with the fastest life histories. So by ranking the species along this rank, uh, along this slow fast continuum, we can identify what the species have similar and dissimilar life histories. And the identification of groups with similar life histories, it's a very uh, first step, it's an important step to start to construct uh, frameworks of management options to manage data poor species. Because at the end, for a lot of the species, the first information that is available is their, it's usually their biology, their life histories. It's much, much harder to get the data that is required to do stock assessments, to, uh, to, to construct, to construct stock, stock assessments. So, so this, uh, this uh, uh, conceptual framework 
uh, is very useful to manage the deeper species using their biology. So next, uh, we, show, we ask the question, how is Combris fits within the triangular model of his life histories, uh, the triangle of Winnie Miller and Rose? The slow, the slow fast gradients of life history variation in the scombris, which we identify, and all this, the traits that describe that gradient suggest that the life histories of scombris display a broad range of life history strategies uh, going between the periodic and opportunistic strategies. And then bluefin tunas typify a periodic strategies, while the Indian mackerels typify an opportunistic strategy. Next, in the last research, uh, main research chapter, I use the ecological insights gained in chapter two, three, and four, and I put it together to examine the role of life histories and fishing in determining the population trajectories and current exploitation status of scombrids. In order to identify what species are most vulnerable to fishing and to identify what aspects of their life histories render species to be most vulnerable to fishing. And to do this, I develop several a priori hypotheses and test them using an information theoretic approach for to data analysis. So, but first, what determines vulnerability in a species? So the vulnerability of a species depends on the interaction between the intrinsic biology of the species, its ecology, and the exposure of the species to extrinsic threats such as fishing. In the last few decades, the need to priori prioritize management and concentrate efforts to protect the most threatened species has led to numerous comparative empirical studies of species vulnerability. These studies had as an objective to identify what traits better predict vulnerability. So first, I, con I conducted a literature review where I reviewed the findings of 23 empirical studies that have examined this relationship in order to, uh, to summarize uh, so far, what life history traits have been identified as most useful to predict vulnerability in marine fishes? And before I show you the results of the literature review, uh, first I want to explain you a bit how these different studies have been, have been measuring and describing vulnerability in species. For example, some studies use how species respond to, to exploitation, either measured as decline collapses or recoveries, others use the exploitation status of the species, and others use the use in red list threat status. So these are metrics of vulnerability that describe and measure vulnerabilities in the species. A lot of these studies also accounted and corrected for the fishing mortality that the species have been exposed to, but at the end, these studies, what they wanted to do is identify what traits better predict vulnerability in species. So either what traits diagnose species declines, collapses, or recoveries. So what did I find out in our literature review? So I'm going to be showing the number of case studies, and I'm going to be listing the life history correlates that have been tested in these studies, and whether they were found to be a strong correlates, weak correlates, or if they were found to be not predictors at all of vulnerability. So the majority of the studies found that maximum size is the most uh, reliable predictor of either species decline, collapses, recoveries, and threat status. Species with large maximum body sizes, they tend to decline faster, recover slower, and tend to be higher threatened within the UCN categories than species with a smaller maximum body sizes. Then we have maximum weight, length of maturity, age of maturity, uh, growth rate, and, and longevity. And as you can see, uh, these traits have not been tested as often, and these traits show a mixed result in terms of their usefulness as correlates of vulnerability. Then we have fecundity and excise, we have never been identified as a useful correlate of vulnerability, as it is often suggested in the literature. And last, we have the maximum rate of population increase, which has been tested few times and always has been found to be a strong correlate of vulnerability. So at the end, maximum size has been identified most often as the most reliable predictor of vulnerability in marine fishes while the rest of the traits show a mixed evidence for their usefulness. So at the end, these studies, by providing inconsistent results and large amount of uncertainty, they're failing to transmit a clear message, so they're transmitting a poor message. So at the end, it's very hard to take the outcomes of these studies and transform them into practical conservation strategies. So how can this message be improved? How the, the results from these studies can be transformed 
into more conservation practices. Several recommendations have been put forward. For example, focus on one taxonomic group and one type of threat. Second, test a large number of traits, but also focus on testing a priori hypotheses that are based on biological reference uh, relevance. And this is what we did for Scumbridge. So for Scumbridge, I had data for 21 populations of tunas and mackerels, and I used it to uh, examine the role of life histories and fishing in determining their population trajectories and current exploitation status, which we used to infer vulnerability for this group of species. Why, why we did this? Well, remember, I had compiled stock assessments. From these stock assessments, I extracted a series of exponent stock biomass, and I used this data to estimate three proxies of, of vulnerability. The first one, rate of decline in biomass, so how fast biomass decreases over time. The second, the extent of decline in biomass within the last 50 years. And then the exploitation status. We know whether the population is overfished or not because we can compare it with, their, with the BMSY. Second, we have information on the time, time series of fishing mortality rates that the species have been exposed for during their uh, period of exploitation. And we know about the life history strategies of scumbries. So with this information, I developed and tested three a priori hypotheses. The first one, I tested whether fishing mortality rates alone is the main factor determining their population trajectories and current exploitation status. In the second and third hypothesis, I tested whether fishing mortality rates in combination with life histories better determines their population trajectories and current exploitation status. And if life histories are important, I wanted to know what aspects of the life history are better predictors of vulnerability. So I tested whether the first size trait axis of life history variation using maximum body size as a proxy is a better predictor of vulnerability, or if, if instead the second slow fast rate axis under frost growth rate is a better predictor of vulnerability. So we tested our three a priori hypotheses for each of our proxies of vulnerability, and we evaluated our hypothesis using an information theoretic approach, an AIC to run hypothesis, and general linear models, either linear models or binomial models, depending on our type of the response variable. So this is my first metric, the rate of decline in biomass. And here I'm showing the average rate of decline for scumbrid populations against the relative fishing mortality rates that these populations have been exposed for during the uh, uh, period of exploitation. So we find that the higher the maximum the higher the relative fishing mortality, the faster the rate of decline. But see that there is some variation along the points. So then we find that population with a slow growth rates uh, have declined faster in adult biomass than populations with faster growth rates given the same fishing mortality rates or after control for fishing mortality. So then our third hypothesis shows higher strength of evidence. So we find that growth rates in combination with fishing better predicts rates of decline in scumbrid populations. Our second metric, extent of decline in biomass. Again, the average extent of decline against the average relative fishing mortality. I find that the populations, the, uh, the relative, the higher the fishing mortality, the larger the extent of decline in the populations. And we find that populations with slower growth rates have decreased more in, bi in biomass that population with faster growth rates given the same fishing mortality rates. So again, the third hypothesis shows higher in strength of evidence. Then our third metric, we model the probability of being overfished. We find that the probability of currently being overfished is higher for populations that have been exposed to higher fishing mortalities and find that populations with slower growth rates have a higher probability of being overfished than species with faster growth rates given the same fishing mortality rates. So again, our third hypothesis has the higher strength of evidence. So then what we learn is that the scumbrids with slow life histories, which tend to inhabit more temperate climates, are more likely to have experienced faster and larger declines in biomass and have a higher probability of being currently overfished. We also find that the traits describing the slow fast continuum or the speed of life gradient, which is typically growth and longevity, are the best predictors of a species decline and current exploitation status. So we have to give recommendation and set conservation strategies to best diagnose what species are most at risk, what would I do? Well, if you remember in, in this figure from our literature review, I find that maximum size is the best predictor of a species decline. 
But then, in, cost, in contrast, in our study of vulnerabilities across the community populations, we find that growth rate and longevity are better predictors and not necessarily maximum body size. So how can we reconcile these results? Well, I think that the geography, the scale of the studies might matter. While maximum size has been identified as best predictor of declines, uh, in, in mostly in regional studies, these regional studies usually have worked on community of species inhabiting similar habitats. Then we wonder what's going on on the, uh, on the global scale. But there is only one study that has attempted to measure the usefulness of several life history traits to diagno diagnose species collapses. And this global study has found that life histories are not really useful to diagnose species collapses or population collapses a priori. Because this study finds that small and short-lived species have collapsed as often as large and long-lived species. So then what traits should we use as best surrogates in data poor situation? Well, if maximum size is the only trait available, particularly within regional context, I would recommend to use maximum size as a surrogate of a species vulnerability to fishing. But definitely, if we're working at large geographical scale, time-related traits such as growth rate and longevity describing the slow fast continuum of life histories should be a better proxy to rank species sensitivities to fishing. And to conclude, I will briefly summarize the main findings and conclusions of this thesis. So my thesis agro uh, addresses two global ch challenges that are hindering the successful implementation of ecosystem-based man management in the world's fisheries. The first one reflects our limited understanding on the historical impacts of fishing on, fi on marine species and marine ecosystems. And the second challenge reflects our limited knowledge on the current exploitation status for the majority of the species that we exploit and our limited capacity to identify what species are most at risk. I focus on discombrate species and uh, I use existing information that I collected throughout the world and analyze it using meta-analysis techniques and comparative methods in order to provide new insights and some answers to these challenges. So when I started my PhD, the extent and the impacts of fishing on large pelagic species, such as tunas, was highly debated in the literature. And in this thesis, I provide the most accurate picture of the global biomass trajectories of scrumbled species within the last 50 years, estimated that their global adult biomass has decreased by 50% during the last 50 years, concluding that the global population declines in tuna species is not or not as bad as previously thought. This study also reveals that after 50 years of industrialized fisheries, now the majority of the populations have been fished down to optimum levels globally, which means that the majority of the populations are fully exploited, which means that an increase in catches for these fisheries is very limited, uh, are very limited in the short term without jeopardizing the global sustainability of this group of species. In this thesis, I also identify major gaps and I set priorities for future life history research. Two, I identify two groups, or I see scumbridge as two groups going at different speeds. While globally, the majority of life history research and fishery stock assessments and management has been focused on the data-rich species, mostly principal market tunas and temperate mackerels, uh, we have given less priorities to the rest of coastal a smaller coastal scumbrid species. Although I emphasize that we need to continue doing life history research on the data rich species as needed, for example, the biology of the, the, the reproductive biology of the principal market tunas is remar remarkably poorly known. I also think we have forgotten about the role and importance of, mon of many coastal scumbrid species because then uh, the, uh, the smaller coastal scumbrid species, they sustain important fisheries throughout the, their distribution and they're a source of wealth and food security for many fishing communities throughout the world. Then while the RK selection theory does not explain the full diversity in scumbrid life histories, we find that uh, most of the life history variation in scumbrids can be explained along three axes. Uh, one driven by body size, the second driven by the speed of life, and the third describes the reproductive uh, allocation in fishes. At the end, the second axis, the speed of life gradient, largely explained by the environment, is the most important to rank species sensitivities to fishing. 
And then while the only global study that has uh, examined the usefulness of multiple life history traits to diagnose population collapses in the world's fisheries finds that life histories are not really useful or determinant to diagnose a priori population collapses. Contrary to this study, I find that multiple studies, regional studies throughout the globe, suggest that a uh, maximum size is a good uh, predictor of uh, species vulnerability. And also, our comparative analysis of fish our comparative analysis of vulnerability in scumbries also su suggests that that uh, life history correlates describing the slow fast continuing in fishes, therefore the speed of life are good predictors of species uh, sensitivities to fishing. So at the end, if we understand how uh, the environment shapes life histories and know fishing, the fishing patterns to what they've been exposed, we can use this information to diagnose a species vulnerability to fishing. Finally, I would like to emphasize that two main pro products of this thesis are the two life history data sets that I created. The first one is the stock assessment data set, which includes information, uh, which includes uh, stock assessment information for 26 population. And then the life history data sets, which includes life history information from almost 700 life history studies. These data sets have already been used in several research projects in the past, are currently being used in some research projects, and I really hope that this data will continue supporting future life history, future research for Scombridge. Just to give an example, uh, the life history data set and the stock assessment data set were used by the IUCN Tuna and Bill Fish Specialty Group to assess for the first time the population and conservation status for all known species of scombris using the IUCN Red List categories and criteria. And then this will be my final remark. Tunas and their relatives dominate one of the largest ecosystems and sustain some of the most valuable fisheries in the world. Our society is faced with the trade-off of exploiting these natural precious resources, but also we have the responsibility to manage and conserve them for the benefit of humanity. I strongly believe that the only way forward is to use science-based approaches to drive the management and conservation for this group of species if we really want to uh, uh, get the, to maximize the best outcomes. I also strongly believe that I also think that effective co collaboration among all the RFMOs needs to be more effective in order to decrease duplicities uh, and maximize outcomes and, and share resources. And last, I think it's very critical that all the key players that are engaged in these fisheries, from the industry to scientists to managers to fishermen to NGOs, they need to work together and in, in engage together to ensure sustainable fisheries for this group of species and healthy oceans. So I would like to conclude acknowledging many of these people. First, I need to start with my supervisors. I thank you for all the great advice and support throughout all these years. I learned a lot from all of you. I also uh, would like to thank all the funding sources, the Mercury Actions through the Metoceans, Metoceans Project and Afti Technalia, my scholarship from La Junta de Galicia and through the University of La Coruña, funding from Caja Madrid Foundation, and even the Tuna Conference and the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation that has funded some of my trips to the Tuna Conference. Also, would like to thank my research group, all the people from the Recursos Marinos y Pesquerías at the University of La Coruña. I would like to thank all of you. you. You've been great throughout all this year, supporting me not only morally, but also professionally. I also would like to thank all my colleagues and friends from the Earth to Ocean Research Group at Simon Fraser University. One of the best things that has happened to me has been to land in that lab. Thanks a lot. And of course, I would like to thank my friends and my family. And with this, thank you very much for your attention.